Hello, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the ERCAD for this uh, new, uh, I would say, e courses on, uh, on the sleeve gastroplasty. Uh, I would say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your location. Uh, so, this is the second time we are uh, proposing a live demonstration of the on the sleeve gastroplasty. Uh, the operator will be uh, Silvana Peretta uh, with uh, some people around her, including Margarita Pizzicanella, who is from Italy also. So it's an uh, Italian team today. Uh, we have the chance of having two chairmen, very well known guys, because we have uh, Lise Ransrum, uh, no need to present him. And we have uh, Manuel Net Galvao Neto from Brazil. So. Uh, both are remote, I'm on site. Uh, and of course, these are the specialists who will uh, interfere with uh, Silvana regarding the different questions during the live surgery. Uh, probably the majority of you do know today the principle of this uh, interactive session. Interactive means that you can ask your question. You have the Q&A uh, app on your Zoom platform. You can write your questions. And inside of the, the room, we have two people. We have uh, Juan Verde from Argentina and Rita Rodriguez from Mexico who are collecting your questions and then will present the question to the audience. Uh, sometimes you will have support of some slides that uh, Silvana can comment also. So really we want to uh, to uh, stimulate this interaction because this is really the base of this sort of uh, uh, e-session. So uh, I think that now we can uh, connect ourselves to uh, Silvana if she's ready in the operating theater. Uh, and you can see uh, Silvana is, uh, is ready. And I can see that Rita is on the side. Uh, I don't know where is Margarita. Uh, surprise, But surprise. Silvana will come in. So I, I leave you to the ground. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, hello everybody. And hi Lee, hi Manuel. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, and uh, I see that some of us are already on vacation, uh, south of France, Lee, You're looking good, much better than the OR. Manuel is working as I am, I can see. So Manuel, you always work. So it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, we, we changed a little bit. I, uh, Rita is helping me. So we have a girl team, but a mixed team, Italy and Peru, that's not bad. <laughs> And uh, we're going to perform an endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. As Bernard mentioned before, um, I'd like it to be as interactive as possible. You're free to ask questions, and uh, we will do our best to, um, to answer them. Uh, we're going to use a uh, double channel scope from Olympus and the double channel overstitch system from Apollo Endosurgery. Uh, this system now also is available for single scopes and um, uh, it's a big advantage because the uh, double channel uh, system that I'm using can only be mounted on the Olympus double channel scope, therapeutic gastroscope, whereas a single channel is compatible with most single channel scopes. I am uh, uh, very comfortable using this one. And uh, I will use this today, but uh, they are equivalent. Uh, what I will do just before starting the procedure is uh, just very quickly talk about something that is very important and is the position of the patient and the uh, setting of the uh, equipment. As you can see here, we're working in close collaboration with the anesthesiologists 
and you have the, I don't know, Carlos, if this is better for you. The patient is lying supine under general anesthesia and she is intubated. And I also position an overtube after having checked again that everything is fine with her esophagus and stomach. This is a very particular overtube. The main um, aim is to ease the introduction of the uh, uh, double channel scope, which um, is a little bit bulky since it has this um, uh, over the scope suturing device over here. And so uh, since uh, um, the introduction can be more complex without the overtube, I do like to secure the airways. The anesthesiologist is more comfortable also when I manipulate around this area. And it also helps us keep a nice pneumogastrium because this is a very particular overtube. It has a, um, a little valve here. It's a, like a trocar with a valve that allow us to uh, inflate and deflate the little balloon that we have here so that I can kind of regulate the amount of insufflation that I'd like in the stomach. I like the patient to be supine because we are working on obese patients and like to have the liver, the bowel and the omentum away from my working field. We're gonna put full thickness sutures and it's very important to know the anatomy very well. With the patient supine, I can, supine, I can also tilt the patient head up a little bit so that I can facilitate the exposure because I'm gonna move down the bowel and the fat away from my uh, working field. So we're gonna go ahead and, and start. I'm gonna start charging my uh, suture. I'm gonna ask Rita to hold the scope for me. And uh, while she's doing that, I'm gonna just quickly present the case if I can have the slides. So this is a 50 year old uh, lady and uh, the BMI is 38.3. She has a lot of comorbidity. It's like a textbook of internal medicine. Among those sleep apnea, asthma, diabetes and hypertension. Uh, she uh, did underwent several um, uh, nutritional um, uh, regimen and they, she failed all of them. And her workup was uh, just as any bariatric patients who are coming to our bariatric unit to undergo a uh, surgical or endoscopic uh, procedure. And of course, her gastroscopy was totally negative. So we're gonna go ahead and start. Can you take it out? Yeah, there we go. So Rita very kindly loaded uh, the first suture for me. We're gonna use non-reabsorbable polypropylene sutures. And this is a, the uh, needle holder that we're gonna use that I'm gonna introduce into the larger channel, the one on the right side of the scope. I'm gonna open up my handle and start the introduction. We placed uh, the sutures in water. This is a hydrophilic filament. So if you put it in water, it will slide much nicely into the channel. So what we like to do is have a little bit of slack, maybe a little bit too much like this, huh? just to smoothen the manipulation. I'm gonna close and just check that everything is working fine. It's a good idea to double check that things are okay before entering uh, the device because uh, we're not doing open surgery laparoscopy and endoscopy. You're far away from your, your entry point and you have to check that everything is working fine before you start. I'm gonna go down introducing very gently the device into the, uh, the overtube. And now we'll ask Rita to put some uh, gel in the tube to facilitate the introduction. It's a good idea to put the gel after the uh, uh, scope and the camera are inside, so you're not gonna have any smudging. This is a trick that I learned from Manuel. So Manuel, thank you very much. It's, it's uh, very useful. Very important when you're introducing the scope to keep the cable that, rely, that uh, relies the um, handle to the tip of the scope at the same, uh, in the same position to avoid any curling and kinking around it. So we're gonna go very gently. Then Rita now is slightly inflating the balloon. 
Can you deflate and inflate again? So we're going to show it. So if I push now, I'm pushing blindly. So I don't know where I'm going and I do have a risk of perforation. When she's inflating the balloon, I have a beautiful view and I can go ahead and introduce everything in a very safe and secure fashion. There we go. So we are inside the stomach and I'm going to show you our landmark. Increase the light and decrease the light in the room if possible. Vous me baissez les lumières de la salle, s'il vous plaît? So, Silvana, we already have two questions here, and I think it's regarding the beginning. Okay. So, one question is uh, if it's uh, 35 or more, why not bypass? And the other, what are the indications? It was very clear in your presentation that this lady had so many uh comorbidities that uh that's why the this was uh choose, chosen but you can uh, you can add if you want it yeah of course that's a very good question uh when i see a patient here since i'm a surgeon so i also do bariatric surgery i always um tell the patients that they have a lot of uh, options they can do uh they can have a bypass a sleeve gastrectomy or an endoscopic procedure this patient did not want to have surgery uh, she'd rather have a, an endoscopic procedure first, and then if, uh, if she's fine with it, then we have a good weight loss and good uh, impact on her comorbid condition, we will stay there. If that is not the case, and this can happen, I would say, in less than 25% uh, of the cases, we can go ahead and, uh, and uh, do something that is more aggressive. But more and more, I see patients that want a step-by-step -step approach to their obesity, which is totally... Uh, uh, logical and uh, to me it's a very good way uh, to treat a chronic disease such as such as obesity I don't know what's your opinion Manuel uh, you know we do the same <laughs> okay that does kind of that does kind of raise a philosophical question though um, if if she has this procedure and she doesn't lose weight uh, is that a good indication for a surgical procedure or a bad indication? You see? I don't know, Lydia, this is the question of the century. So we'll think <laughs> about it while we're starting the procedure here. And uh, maybe we should, uh, if, the, if the participants have an idea or an opinion, please feel free to write it so we can, at the end of the, uh, of the, uh, the live, we can see uh, what's, the, uh, what's the general thought on, on this topic. So, little bit of orientation. So you can see here that on the right side of the screen right here, I have the incisora, and this is where we're going to start the procedure. Uh, we have the anterior wall of the stomach, and those are the two main landmarks. So uh, we're going to spare the antrum and really start at the level of this uh, arch, the incisora of the stomach. Uh, I like to start, as I learned from both Lee and Manuel, uh, a little bit far away from the incisora because the incisora is very muscular, it's very thick, and the, the stitches will not hold. So it's good to start a little bit uh, behind the incisora, proximal to the incisora, to place the first stitch. It will hold uh, longer. In order to fetch the tissue, Rita is going to help me manipulate this uh, expose. Elix device, which is like a corkscrew, and is going to help me grab the tissue and ease the tissue into the jaws of the device. So we're going to start over here. One, two, three. As Manuel would say, one for you, yeah. one for me. And then Perfect. I'm going to rent the scope so that I can have a very nice full thickness bite. Do. Rita is reversing. A little bit of blood is nothing. It's, it's normal. Usually the drop of blood is always on the camera. So we're going to pursue onto the um, greater curve, aiming posteriorly. One, two, three. Again, I don't move my scope. It's the tissue that is coming to my scope. And I also pay attention that I am perpendicular to the tissue to have a good grab. Okay, so I keep going. Okay. Si on peut faire un peu de spasfond, elle a beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup de, elle bouge beaucoup. 
She has a very strong peristalsis. That's why you have the impression that the incisor is moving away, but it's just peristalsis. So this can actually happen if you're not sure about where the incisor is. You just uh, uh, look at the upper part of the of the, um, uh, the, the anterior wall of the stomach and you will always find it. So the good question here is uh, how much do I tighten this first stitch? And uh, what, I, what I learned is that I have to go halfway through like a um, hemi-circumferential in order to have something that is tight enough but not too tight so that I'm not over tightening. Because if you, we put this stitch too tight, we're gonna create a um, um, hypertensive uh, stomach and the stitches are not gonna hold well. So here I have uh, half of the circumference. So we'll start going back, placing a uh, U-shape stitch. I don't know what you think, Lear Manuel. So, Silvana, uh, I just wanted to highlight to everybody that it really looks like uh, a surgical suture line with no suture crossing. And it, it is amazing how uh, it, uh, it, it looks in a way that it's not random uh, putting stitches all over, but actually you are uh, following uh, a surgical path as we are doing suturing uh, over uh, any, any, any surface. And yes, we use, uh, actually, uh, we use a mix of U-shape and the square shape. I don't know what about Lee does now. Yeah, we kind of do a W uh, shape to kind of get some stomach shortening, uh, which seems more and more like one of the mechanisms uh, for the procedure. So you see that I'm gonna do a U. I am uh, less, I would say, um, uh, sophisticated than Lee and Manuel. I do a purse ring, a good old surgical purse ring that works very well for me. So it's an oval or a U or it's, it's, it's a simple suture that holds well. I think the key here is really how you grab the, the tissue that you go perpendicular and, and that uh, you don't place too many stitches because as you uh, would, would, would have the same effect in surgery, if you place too many bites with the same suture, that's not gonna hold properly. So I'm going back to the same point where I started and this is the posterior wall. So we're gonna go here and I'm leaving, as you can see here, a little bit of space in between the suture so that I can have that shortening effect that Lee was uh, mentioning before. Okay, so we're gonna reload and place our last stitch exactly at the same height. Okay. One, two, three. All right, so you see that Rita stops when the tissue is starting to uh, rotate around the helix device. And that means that you have to stop because you're actually crossing the, um, uh, the gastric wall. So I'm gonna release now my suture just by applying pressure and pushing on this blue button like this. Okay, and now we're gonna cinch. In order to cinch and to close to secure the suture, I'm gonna start pre-cinching and just very gently, kind of uh, tailoring, I would say, the closure. So we have a 50% reduction of the um, area. In order to cinch, we're gonna use a cinching device that is gonna trap the suture into position. It's just a uh, plastic cylinder. Just gently, gently, okay. That I'm gonna slide and use to secure the suture. Very important, very little moving and always push your cinch parallel to the suture, not perpendicular because otherwise your suture is gonna go. I like to hold the suture myself at the beginning. When you're learning, you can have your assistant hold the suture. So I'm holding the scope with my left hand and I'm pushing with my right hand, the cinch down. Very gentle, push and release, push and release, always feeling what's going on here, the tension. 
And now Rita very gently, it's gonna close. I say very gently because uh, Manuel witnessed this uh, event live. If you are too enthusiastic and you close very strongly, what's gonna happen is that you're gonna cut the suture or worse, you're gonna, um, you're gonna uh, fix the cinch into the mucosa with the old uh, uh, metallic wire. So you want somebody who's very delicate and can feel the pressure already done. So, so, so I'm gonna put another idea. stitch. As you are cleaning and preparing, uh, we got some questions from the audience here that are very good ones. So the weight loss is the same of bypass. Also procedure, it, we will impair the possibility of uh, any bariatric procedures yes, in the future yeah. and a learning curve. So uh, I can start answering. That's not the, the same weight loss of a bypass. We are targeting 15% of or uh, up to 20% of percent of total weight loss, uh, it's not going to impair the possibility of new uh, bariatric procedure. You can do a sleeve, you can do a bypass. And the learning curve, Silvana, I leave it up to you because we otherwise are going to be biased. Oh. Okay, go ahead. I think that the uh, learning curve really depends on uh, your endoscopic skills. This is not for a procedure for somebody who never has never done endoscopy before. Uh, and um, I think it's very easy to learn for surgeons that are endoscopists because the most complex thing is to understand the anatomy. The device can be learned. The use of the device is not a big deal. Uh, we do in surgery things, expose, expose, okay, one, two, three, that are much more complex. And uh, the technicality of the device can be learned in the lab very well. There have been uh, some papers that have been published, and I think that Bernard has them in the slides that I prepared, that show that it takes about, I would say, a 10 to 12 procedure in order to improve the uh, uh, proficiency of the suture placement. But um, Gautron Lopez Nava published a paper saying that it takes about 34 procedure in order to uh, get better results in terms of um, uh, weight loss. Now, uh, uh, there are, uh, we did something very nice. Um, we measured Manuel uh, doing an ESG and we measured uh, one of our fellows with motion tracking devices just to see if there was a difference. And you can see here, uh, it was uh, very nice to see how uh, Manuel uh, had a much smoother curve than our fellow, which uh, had a curve that was uh, a little more um, all over the place, I would say. So um, it, it does have a, um, a bit of a learning curve, but once again, uh, this is a procedure that it's uh, um, easy uh, to learn. Uh, this standardization can be a little bit tricky in order to achieve the best possible results. So, Lana, there's another, there's another question. Um, how often do you encounter a bigger blood vessel? When you took the first bite, there's a little bit of mucosal bleeding, but uh, how often do you get uh, some more substantial bleeding, and what do you do in that case? Uh, it's very rare, actually. Uh, I mean, it's not very rare. I, I uh, never had uh, um, really important bleeding, substantial bleeding. I always had the kind of bleeding that you have seen uh, just before. And this is something that happens all the time. And you just pull a little bit onto your uh, suture uh, and, uh, and the bleeding usually stops. What you can do is also, if the bleeding is more important, you could just cinch and close your suture as you would do if you were... Um, doing a, uh, in surgery, you, you, you apply pressure and the bleeding will just stop. I was, um, I never had to use uh, any clipping or other um, energy device in order to stop the bleeding. Pulling on the suture or closing the cinch was always um, uh, sufficient. Yeah, actually we, we just sent to publication our Brazilian consensus with around 2000 cases, Lee and Silvana. And the bleeding, significant bleeding was 0.1, 0.1%, meaning that you have to do something to take care of the bleeding. So it's pretty much uh, interesting and, and significant. We also have questions here for uh, our friend Tarek Saleh from UAE, asking if we reinforce the first suture and for sure we don't, not Subana. And reinforcing is something that uh, uh, I'll let you discuss if you want it. 
to reinforce the sutures? Yeah, reinforce, yeah the first one or any in, in, in other suture. Yeah, no, I, it really depends on, on the tissue. So here I finished. Um, I, I place all my stitches and at the end of the procedure, I see if I have to reinforce. Um, I, I, my impression, uh, we have done about 200 cases so far here, is that uh, it doesn't really make a difference once you're over your, that's my finger, once you're over the learning curve, because the more of this procedure you do, the better you place uh, your stitches. It doesn't, ma it doesn't mean that you place more stitches. It means that your, your actual bite is more uh, accurate in terms of thickness and depth of, uh, of penetration. But I know yeah. that uh, Abu Daye is doing a study that is not ended yet. And they seem to uh, have a uh, slightly better results with, with reinforcement. Correct me if I'm wrong, Manuel. Yeah, we're gonna have uh, yes. It's the it's a FDA trial, uh, an RCT trial, and we're gonna have the results by the end of the year. I think the first results. Uh, Silvana, let me tell you that the question and answer here, the chat is mm -hmm. just blooming. We all yes. have a lot of good questions. And may I proceed with some questions? Yeah, sure, sure. Oh, sure. I'm, I'm just so just one second. Yeah, we on. are we placed our two first stitches as you can see Beautiful. here. And uh, I have this water here, which tells me that I'm very close to the fundus. So while Manuel is reading the question, I will clean my channel and I will aspirate, uh, suction the, the juice. So the one here of uh, Jose Fernandez is if it is an ambulatory procedure or not. And now I can answer that it depends depending on your setup. Patients can go home on the same day or can stay overnight. It depends on your setup. And the other that's very important, how long the suture lasts? And we have here so many times this question, not, not Lee uh, and, uh, and Silvana, and the suture doesn't matter. What matters is what outside with the uh, serosa to serosa opposition. So Silvana and Lee, feel free to, to comment on that because this is very, very uh, present question. How the suture lasts? Actually, we did a study uh, uh, that was just published this year, and um, we systematically check all our ESG at six months, 12 months, and two years. And uh, the study we published is on the uh, one-year endoscopic follow-up. And what we could see is that uh, at one year, only 6.9% uh, of, uh, of uh, patients uh, had a a, an open gastroplasty. The rest had either an intact gastroplasty with all the suture present, uh, uh, or uh, had they partially intact gastroplasty where uh, one or two sutures uh, were a little bit uh, relaxed. But as Manuel was saying, is the um, lack of a, um, uh, the lack of distensibility that the serosa to serosa apposition induces that is responsible for the, for the restriction. So here, let me going to show you, show you this. Um, we grabbed a little bit too much and you see that I have a resistance. So I'm going to ask Rita to undo one. And now it comes much better. We're going to do it again. When it doesn't want to come, do not insist. Okay. And, and, change, and change spot. This is a uh, just being, um, I would say, uh, careful. Don't uh, insist. Yeah, and we can see how beautiful. And then what so you do, the, no, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say there's another question uh, that always comes up. Um, does the procedure, this is from Tame Patavale, does the procedure lead to any difficulty in future bariatric surgery if it should be needed? So uh, we have a video for that because when I was preparing for this live, I, I thought I will show I will show it because we always get this question, and I don't know if uh, Bernard can show it, uh, and um, it, it's not difficult. You, you we have a uh, very very little uh, adhesions that are left in the abdominal uh, cavity, and here you see it uh, on on the screen. So this is a patient that I did and um, uh, she uh, did not do well with the gastroplasty, and I, I did a gastric bypass procedure. And that's pretty much all I had in the abdomen. Of course, uh, it depends on how you do the gastroplasty, how well you respect the landmarks, and how well you respect the anatomy. And, uh, and um, 
if I would, I would suggest, should you do another procedure, go for a gastric bypass procedure, uh, because it's not very smart to keep repeating the same strategy if it was not successful in the first place. So I would not do a sleeve. And also, if you do a gastric bypass, you shouldn't be approaching even the territory where the suture were placed at the endoscopic procedure. If you do it, do it under endoscopic control. It is recommended because uh, you will feel more comfortable and you will avoid stapling uh, the, um, uh, the cinch, the plastic part. Stapling on the suture, stapling onto the um, uh, a little metallic tea tag, it's okay. But the cinch can actually create some problems with the, um, uh, with the staple. Wait, uh, also to run up and leave as, as your procedure is doing so smooth that we uh, have uh, enough time to, to go to the didactics. I think we have prepared some question poll that I think um, if Lee agrees and Silvana, we can put now, if the technical uh, staff can put the, the poll. Yes, okay, we have it. So I just yeah. to understand you guys if you have an experience or not with the procedures. So we are halfway through here and you can see that we have a nice reduction. Uh, we've done this procedure with 3D vision and uh, it's very nice because you can see that we are shrinking the stomach uh, and shortening the stomach, shrinking 60% probably and shortening I would say 30 to 40%. Uh, and when you're using 3D uh, endoscopy, it's very nice because it's, uh, uh, <laughs> we're having a little bit of a shaking problem here. Wait. Okay. What? So it is very that... interesting. <laughs> Lee, you want to read it? So um, yeah, this is interesting. Uh, almost half of the audience has experience with um, endoscopic procedures. So. Um, okay. So it's 50-50. Do you have any, any more uh, question on the poll to, to, to ask? As Silvana is just, uh, she just uh, solved the problem there. Okay. So that, uh, that again, that's some questions that are being kind of not repeated, but asking in a different way. And uh, uh, the, are we concerned with tearing the mucosa? We're tearing the mucosa? Uh, not really. We're tearing the mucosa, no. If you tear the mucosa, it bleeds. So you have to be uh, 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 prepared for that. Uh, that was the but, um, that was a question from Kamal. And uh, Javi Shankar, I think he, he works with, uh, with Gautran. Uh, welcome, Javi. So the question is resuturing. Uh, after after a while, if the sutures get loose or something down the road, uh, do you guys uh, offer resuturing? That's a very good question for for you, Silvana, and for Lee. Yeah, uh, we we do, uh, but uh, we have been doing it so far. So since we're doing anyway endoscopy at six months and one year, if at the six months endoscopy the patient hasn't reached. Uh, a BMI inferior to 30, we do offer resuturing if and only if the patient was compliant with the, um, with the dietary uh, uh, support and, um, and, uh, and follow-up. If the patient uh, was not, uh, we, we, uh, so here it was my fault, so I didn't charge, I was distracted. Um, so we, yes, we, we do resuture, but uh, only if the patient is compliant. If the patient was lost of follow-up or if the patient is not coming to see us in, uh, in, the, in the office, uh, or if the BMI is inferior to 30, we don't resuture. Uh, we have done, I, I think, about uh, 60 revisions so far. Impossible to tell if they're really uh, making a difference long term. So we're going to start from September randomized trial uh, for revision at six months. Yeah, we, uh, uh, in our series, uh, our proper series in Brazil at Endovita uh, with Gustavo and Greco, uh, we are reaching three years now, uh, Silvana and Lee, and we have restructured 2% uh, of the patients. Yeah. I think in the United rate. States as well, it's not very common to resuture, but it's more because of reimbursement 
issues. Uh, the device is rather expensive and we'd have to apply for a pre-authorization, et cetera. So uh, we're a little bit, a little bit more, I, I would say most patients in the United States don't get resutured and instead would be, if they did well, following the endo sleeve, they would be referred for surgery if they regain their weight. Uh, if they didn't do well, they'd be referred for medical treatment. Okay, awesome. very strict. But uh, I think there is a role, and I think if I'm not wrong, Manuel, uh, um, uh, now they are, the, me and you, we have always been advocating the uh, second chance or the chance of uh, repeating this procedure. It's endoscopy, a lot of other procedures, for instance, nothing to do with obesity, but ablation of barrett by radiofrequency. We know that we go different times to achieve the, uh, the results that we want. So it's not shocking to me if this is an ambulatory procedure and uh, in some patients we can do it under sedation to repeat the procedure. Of course, uh, there is a, a matter of costs, uh, but um, uh, I, it's, mu it's much uh, less aggressive than, than, than surgery and results of repeating this over time, especially when you start with a very high uh, BMI, uh, can be very good. Yes, Ivana, I completely agree, uh, as you know, and giving people second chance, it is not a bad thing. It is not. Uh, and, and actually, it, the, the endoscopic approach allows you to. This is a chronic progressive disease. So if we, we were talking about diabetes or hypertension, people, we always going to change the, the treatment down the road. And it's as a surgery. So uh, unfortunately, nothing lasts that much in, uh, when you're treating obesity. So you have to establish a plan and keep up to the plan. And every single patient have a particular plan. So uh, yeah, I, I, I have to... Sorry, Manuel. No, no, I just saying that uh, I agree with you as usual. <laughs> no, no, I don't know if it's as usual, but uh, uh, you, you said it right, it's a chronic disease and we don't have to forget that we're palliating. So uh, we are, we are, surgery is not perfect. Surgery is also a way to palliate the disease. And it, uh, palliation has to be uh, as, as uh, little invasive as uh, possible. And then when we compare the uh, results in terms of quality of life and, and uh, comorbid um, condition uh, resolution with, uh, with uh, sleeve gastrectomy, we, we have seen that we uh, did have a much better quality of life for the uh, gastroplasty patients and uh, we did have the same impact on comorbid condition so the question is 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 weight all that matters really or uh, do we do we approach this disease as we would do for a chronic metabolic disease yeah and in on that direction we have uh, some uh, very good questions in in terms of uh, what are the complications that we should expect after this procedure and it, it's this procedure, when we compare uh, with sleeve gastrectomy it, in terms of a reflux, and also, Silvana, how do you expect your patient to wake up and how it will go on the following days? And you can compare with surgery, with balloons. Yeah, so we do our patient now uh, in an out, outpatient, so they go home the same day, unless uh, uh, they have a... Um, some comorbid condition that prevents us to do so, but most of them go home the same day. And actually we have to justify if they stay at the hospital now. And uh, uh, for those who don't have uh, the morphology of these patients, uh, we do it under sedation. So patients are very well. The only thing that I have in 90% of my patient is nausea. Uh, and uh, you really have to be extremely aggressive in preventing vomiting from happening because it's intuitive that if they, they're retching and they're trying to vomit, uh, you will um, partially undo the, um, uh, your, your, your stitches that have just been placed. But they're doing very well. They have very little pain. Uh, and uh, after 48 hours, most of them go back to their normal activity. So it's something that compares favorably to surgery, of course. So what's and your recipe you for nausea prevention? Uh, Solana. Uh, uh, we're, go we, we're giving just um, uh, qu'est-ce qu'on donne pour les nausées, nous? Du Zofren. Zofren, yes. Uh, on Dancetron, actually. 
but um, uh, I have to say that something, sometimes it's not enough. Uh, just before answering any further question and discussion, I'm done. I don't know if Lee and Manuel agree because uh, I'm reaching the, uh, here is the, um, the Z line. I'm a level at the level of the uh, gastroesophageal junction. I left the fundus free. So we could potentially put another stitch there. But uh, as uh, Lee was saying before, um, one of the key points of this procedure is to be um, to shorten the stomach and to preserve the fundus that will act as a reservoir in order to uh, increase the satiety of the patient over time. So usually uh, I would stop here. And my landmark is when I go inside, I see directly my sleep. I don't see the fundus. And I don't like to move around my device, especially the double channel device around the esophagus. So if you're starting, don't be too aggressive, don't be too greedy and stop right here when you see with your scope that you're backing up into the, um, the esophagus. Taking more of the fundus will not improve the weight loss of the patients. I'm gonna just clean up a bit so for you to have a good view. So Silvana, let's, as you are cleaning up, let's check some questions here. So in this question, I think uh, we, uh, we have to answer collectively because one is uh, how will you compare uh, the ESG with sleeve gastrectomy in terms of GERD and how we compare, and this question comes from Iran, uh, what we are doing with the classic laparoscopic greater curvature plication. So if you guys please address mm -hmm. that. So we, we, we looked at uh, our, um, our uh, patients in terms of GERD. Uh, and uh, we did not see any de novo GERD in our patients. In patients who had already pre-existing gastroesophageal reflux disease before this procedure, it either improved after with the weight loss, which is logical, or it stayed the same. So uh, from a symptomatic point of view, from an endoscopic point of view, we did not have a progression of the disease or new disease that we found. I don't know, Lee, if this is the same for you. Yeah, no, that's, that's true. And, and to answer the second question about the procedure of uh, laparoscopic uh, greater curvature imbrication, uh, that's mostly yeah. gone away. I think most people found it was more work to do that procedure than it was to do a sleeve gastrectomy. Had uh, not as good of results, had a lot of breakdown and problems. Uh, a lot of companies tried to make special staples and uh, things to make it quicker and easier, but really um, there's a, still a few pockets out there that do it, but uh, by and large, it's not done very much anymore. So I, I, I took the liberty of uh, thinking that it, I, I was done because uh, you guys didn't say anything, but uh, <laughs> I think I am no, done with the, uh, yes. So um, this is something important. Um, uh, if you if you, you you need to see the antrum, you need to have this passage over here, because otherwise the patient will for sure vomit and it will uh, undo the uh, the strength of the suture because you're going to create hyperpression. One thing that I really recommend you to do is to wash and and suction everything. If you had a little bit of a bleed. Uh, remove and leave a squeaky clean stomach because this is something that can have an impact on postoperative vomiting. So really check everything and will allow also to you to be more secure and safe and uh, sleep better because you know that you left a bloodless, uh, a bloodless field. The other thing, always remove the overtube under control because um, we can comment on this. The injury created by overtubes are one of the f first cause of lawsuits in the, um, in the United States or of, of anything that it's around the esophagus. So now the anesthesiologist is very uh, used to us manipulating around his endotracheal tube so he doesn't come screaming anymore. <laughs> but, um, uh, and it's good because the patient is waking up because we finished. Always check when you remove the overtube that the esophagus is intact and that you don't have any, um, any problem. It's a matter of, uh, of safety and it's a big medical legal issue. So I always check and I look, I not only uh, pull it up, I look that I didn't injury anything and I didn't injury also the, the pharynx. 
and we are removing everything. Awesome. We also awesome. always awesome. check the belly. Beautiful, and we're beautiful. Done. And Tuvana uh, and Lee, so we have uh, uh, some residual questions here, and one is kind of like, uh, so if you see something like an ulcer, like varices, so what is a conditions, conditions that prevents you to do the procedure? And the other one that is very, very uh, coming back uh, is that, uh, so you're gonna leave the fundus unsutured? So is that a sin or is a bless? I said it before, I don't suture the fundus. I don't think it's something that uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, useful uh, for the weight loss. And uh, uh, more and more studies are, are saying that it acts um, uh, as a reservoir. So those are gastric emptying studies. Uh, and um, I believe them. Uh, I think that uh, it's something that should be left in place. And moreover, you can technically suture it, but it's the area where the gastric wall is uh, thinner. And uh, you really have to be careful because otherwise you can tear the stomach and you can run into bleeding. You can also pulling on the gastric wall, tear the spleen, which has been described in the literature or, or stitch a, um, a short gastric vessel. So I think it, it's, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't increase the weight loss and it exposes you to a higher rate of uh, complications. So I don't do it. Manuel, I think you had experience with the POSE procedure with the USGI that directly addressed the fundus, nothing else. Uh, maybe you can discuss the results of that a little bit. Oh yeah, but for sure. Uh, so the, this, what we call POSE one, that was, uh, we target the fundus and the antrum. So it went very well in Europe, but when you, when you went to the, the real deal, the US trial, that is a prospective randomized sham control trial, it fails on uh, demonstrating uh, weight loss over 5%. Uh, so, and now what the company did it and the investigator did it, <laughs> we've done the same what we are doing. They target the gastric body. And now the, the people told trial, the pilot trial uh, in, in Europe show very good results, especially in Spain with Romantoro, Gotran Lopez Nava. Uh, and we were there also, the results are pretty much the same of ESG and they get a new chance. So Braham Abudaye in Mayo is leading a big trial in the US right now, uh, but it's pretty much addressing the, the body. Those placations, they are really different. And I think you have studied that also, Silvana, they might last a little bit, but we, we have to test it uh, by the time. Uh, when, when we used the uh, when we used the device 15 years ago, uh, we still occasionally see patients for stomal reduction things like that. We still see a, a, the occasional patient back that still has sutures after 15 years. So it's quite a robust suture in that case. Yeah, we will see how it goes because it's very very promising. And and I and I personally think that as much. Uh, devices procedure we have on the field, we can refine it uh, and, and make it uh, uh, the endoscopic, uh, I think the endoscopic uh, field more robust. I don't know if what you guys think about it. Leah, I'll let you answer. Uh, yeah, I think that's always when you do things like this, kind of trying to make the sutures last longer or kind of augment it is, is going to affect the cost and how often the patient has to come back. So that should, should definitely be a technology evolution goal uh, to make uh, more robust suturing. Okay. Uh, also, let me tell you guys that we reach almost uh, 200 people on the, on this, uh, in the session. That is was a, a way, uh, a lot of improvements from the very first one. Now we, we yeah. are ready. We target a different group of people and uh, obviously that, uh, brings a lot of people around. And uh, this is a very nice live operation because it's short. We have uh, two excellent discussions, so uh, brings a lot of information. But I'm just asking to Silvana, because I have a slideshow from her, if she wants me to show some specific slides to uh, address some of the points that people were discussing during this uh, demo. Uh, I have, uh, for example, uh, the question of the position of the patient. 
Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, Bernard, this is a, the, what I was showing at the, at the beginning, if you can, yes. The, the, the one before that or after is showing the CD scan. So this is, a, this is a complication rate. And you can see that this is a very, very safe procedure and uh, much safer than, than surgery. And the more you do it, the more you, you have experienced, the safer it is. But to me, one thing is very important, and I said at the beginning, if I can have the next slide, is really the position of the patient because if you put the patient on the, on the side, on the left side, as you would do for endoscopy, um, you can have the, uh, the, the, the liver and the gallbladder that are just rolling over the area where you're placing your stitches. And there has been a case in the literature, I think that, that there are two now in the literature describing a unintentional uh, uh, communication with the gallbladder and by a leak, which is something that can be treated, of course, but it shouldn't be part of this uh, of this procedure. And uh, if we can have the next slide, you see here uh, that uh, you have on the left side of the slide, a, a CD scan of a patient that is on the left side. And you can see that the stomach is totally covered by the, um, uh, the liver and you can see very clearly the gallbladder too. So I would recommend do this with the patient supine. And you can do this also under sedation with the patient supine because an anesthesiologist place the patient uh, on the left side under sedation because they're afraid of the, uh, the fact that you can have some fluid coming from the stomach. But in reality, you're emptying the stomach. You're looking at the stomach, so you have no fluid. And for an obese patient, breathing is not better on the lateral side. So discuss with the anesthesiologist. And if the patient is under general anesthesia, place, place them supine. It's safer, especially at the beginning, uh, until you get very familiar with the anatomy and with the technique. Uh, uh, that th I, I would recommend to you to do so. I have, I have also a slide on a learning curve because there was something that was discussed during the. the yeah, the, the, we we, the we show we we discussed this already during the, the live demo, and this is a very nice study that is uh, showing that after the first ten cases, seven to nine cases, you reach a plateau in terms of your. Uh, how proficient you are in, uh, in placing uh, the, the stitches and completing your procedure. Uh, but once again, this is just a, uh, a technical part, it has nothing to do with uh, improving uh, and in guaranteeing the weight loss. That is something that comes with time. And we show this already, Bernard, this is Manuel, and we have on the next one, Pietro. Uh, this is a very nice suit, it's a motion uh, tracking suit uh, that allows you to track uh, what we do. And uh, you can be very good or, or a little bit bad as this one. And uh, it's, it adds a little bit of science into, into the field and I like it very much. Other, other slides that you would like to share? No, I think we are, we are, we are good Yeah. With, with, with sharing slides. I don't know if there is any other question. Uh, Silvana, you might just mention what your diet orders are going to be for this patient. Yes, I, uh, I, I give them the very first day very little liquids. Once again, I am uh, very concerned about vomiting. If they're totally fine, they have no nausea, they can drink and they can start a oral intake uh, with a um, soft food uh, diet and a liquid diet the day after. And um, the diet is slightly different from uh, what I would use in a bypass or in a sleeve gastrectomy patients because it can be a high fiber diet. They can have a, a wider range of healthy food that they can eat, also solid, much faster than uh, a gastric bypass patients, for instance. And uh, overall, the um, nutritional quality of life if this, in this patient is very good. When we look at their labs in terms of vitamin, uh, very rarely I do need to correct uh, a, a deficiency. So this is also something that shows how, um, how little aggressive we are in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in uh, touching uh, the uh, metabolism of generally of the, uh, of the vit vitamins in these patients. Okay, are there some other questions from uh, the audience? Uh, Lee, Manuel, uh, have you some? We pretty much answer all of them. That was uh, remarkable. Yeah, excellent. So there will be uh, additional sessions in the future. So they can prepare the questions and probably the next time we will prepare a questionnaire before the, 
the, the, the, the session and so we can really target the most important issues regarding the comments of the, the, the participants. So uh, there, there, that, was, that was very pretty well done. I mean, just one hour of connection, uh, patients treated for uh, obesity, uh, we hope so. Uh, so uh, outpatient, um, so this is very challenging for the surgeons and uh, we have uh, really to think uh, flexible also in the, the field of surgery and uh, Silvana, Lee and all the teams is a very nice demonstration of the importance of flexible endoscopy for surgeons because then you can respond to all demands and all the uh, innovation in the, in the medical therapy and surgical therapy. So I would like to thank you very much for being with us. And uh, as Manuel was saying, we were around 200 people uh, watching this uh, live procedure. So very, very nice number. And I just want to finish by giving you this uh, small slide on the next uh, topic that will be developed on the same uh, methods. So you have, uh, for the surgeons who are interested in left colectomy, we have uh, a very nice panel of experts. That's for August 20 and 21. And then uh, one week later with uh, Silvana and Lee, we will share a session on Ayatelania surgery. So we would be very pleased to uh, welcome you back uh, in this uh, e-sessions of uh, IRCA. So thank you for all the chairman, operators, Mar uh, Rita, Silvana, I've seen Margarita coming, uh, Lee, Manuel. So it's a nice team and also the, the visual team because um, uh, Melody did a great job today. Uh, so maybe the final word for uh, Silvana. Yes, no, I just saw uh, you did it for me. I just wanted to thank everybody. Thank Carlos who's behind the, uh, the camera that has been filming us. Thanks of course, Rita who's uh, been helping me, the anesthesiologist and the nurses in the room. And of course my my two, uh, my three chairmen, Bernard, uh, uh, Lee, and Manuel, thank you very much for uh, shadowing me during this, uh, this procedure. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye.